Hi, today we're going to talk about a system that I call the ring and the Z component of angular momentum. This is a first step toward understanding angular momentum more generally in quantum mechanics. Now, I'm writing this for my quantum mechanics class. Frankly, when I teach the prerequisite class, the end of the intro sequence, I do sometimes cover this, so maybe you've seen something like this. It's really supposed to be a stepping stone. We're going to introduce the real three-dimensional Schrodinger equation right after this. And frankly, that's not so easy. So I think this is a nice setup to doing a little understanding of some of the physics that's going on before you jump into the rather hard math. And to do that, frankly, I'm going to talk about this system. And I'm going to talk about one slightly different thing where I look at angular momentum, the property itself, just before the end, because this is a pretty straightforward video, I think. Um, with this problem, it's really pretty easy. You can bring out these aspects and then talk about the general physical property after that. So the problem is the particle mass m constrained to move on a ring, radius a in the xy plane, a circular ring. Uh, there's no potential. And if you're thinking there has to be something holding it on the ring, don't worry about that. And I guess the best way to think of this is that's just what the world for this particle is. And frankly, somewhat later than just talking about angular momentum, you'll realize that that's actually an important way to think about it uh, for deeper mathematical reasons. So there's no potential, but the universe it lives on is a circular ring. So if we were doing what we do a lot of times, uh, classical analog, we could say angular momentum, well, the z component classically is the z component of r cross p. So it's xpy minus ypx. That would be correct. And in fact, we know all about x. We know all about py and the other ones. Uh, but frankly, setting up some equation where I have both coordinates and derivatives in each coordinate and values of the other coordinates. It seems like it could get a little sticky. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from scratch in a sense. Think of how this acts as a single coordinate problem on the ring. So I've only got one coordinate and it's the coordinate around the ring. So in that way of looking at it, the potential is zero everywhere. And I have the Schrodinger equation written on top, and it's full 1D time-dependent form, but this potential is zero, so that term is going to go away immediately when we want to look at solutions. Uh, before we even get to talking about potential, we know we can separate variables, as always. A uh, little sidebar note, I used capital letter phi here for the time part of the solution. Usually I use a small version of that. I did that because I'm going to use a coordinate phi later and I want to distinguish them. This won't come up that often, so don't worry about it. But it's important for me to note. <clears throat> now, the coordinate other than time that I talked about was, I called it x there. Uh, it's not really x, right? It's some coordinate that goes around the circle. So in particular, it's a cyclic coordinate. It doesn't go from minus infinity to infinity. It goes from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, <clears throat> I did call it x for a reason, just because I wanted to remind you that we already know how to solve this problem when there's no potential and just one coordinate. It, the real coordinate is r times the angle, and in fact, we've specified what r is. It's not a coordinate. It's the radius a, just a constant. It's some number. So since we know the general form of solutions, it's a, like a free particle or the inside of a square well. We can use sines, cosines, complex exponentials. Uh, I think sometimes the first time a student looks at this, they say well, there's no boundary condition. There is. A wave function is a function. Functions have one value at any value of the coordinate. So in particular here, what that means is if I look at my coordinate phi and I look 2 pi ahead of that, it's the same physical point and the same mathematical point, and the function better have the same value. 
so must its derivative. So that is a boundary condition, because that gives me something that lets me know how these wave functions fit if they're sines and cosines or complex exponentials. They've got to go through exactly one, or exactly two, or exactly three wavelengths on the way around, but not one and a half, because that would break the derivative, or not three quarters, if you will, of a wavelength around, because that would have both the derivative and the wave function itself not the same. Now, I claim complex exponentials here is a little bit better, and one of the reasons is that we always say for our wave functions, you could put a multiplicative phase, an e to the i times some angle, in front of it, and that's allowed. Here, since the wave functions themselves will have a similar form, that will correspond to shifting your coordinates around by the angle in that complex phase. And that's got to be allowed too, because we already pointed out that there's no reason you have to begin at zero, you could begin anywhere. So we still have quantization from this boundary condition. You've got to have zero, one, two, three wavelengths fitting around. Uh, from that, you can get the energy. So I, I, right away, I can write down what this wave function is as a function of that variable angle, which I call phi, as I noted before. A uh, little important note to make. Everyone calls the quantum number that goes with this m. That's not the mass. It's got nothing to do with the mass. I don't really like it either, to tell you the truth, but everyone does, so I'm sticking to that convention. Uh, but that number, that quantum number, to solve the equation and fit the boundary condition, that can be any integer. And you might wonder, do you need both the positive and negative? And I claim you do. Uh, if you don't see why in a minute, I'll show you. Basically, things are going in opposite directions in some weird sense. Since the absolute square of e to the i m phi is always 1, my normalization is 1 over root 2 pi a. I've already got the whole spatial wave function. Uh, from that, I can get the energy, and I can do that by plugging it back in the Schrodinger equation. Another way to look at the energy is to say that this is equivalent to the classical analog energy, that is angular momentum squared over 2 times the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is twice the mass times a squared, and I use the capital M for mass just to distinguish that from the quantum number. As usual, I can fiddle around with this a little bit to get the time part of the wave function. And when I put those together, which I won't need to use much more, but I wanted to write out, uh, I can see the wave function as this complex exponential e to the i m phi minus i m squared h bar over 2 mass a squared times the time. So indeed, when m is positive, phi must increase as t increases, that it goes, that is, it goes counterclockwise when viewed from positive z, and when m is negative, we view this as going clockwise, the opposite direction. They are, though, in some sense stationary states, but they've got different angular momentum, LZ. So we'll talk more in class about what this means physically when we get on to the more complex systems, but I wanted to work through these solutions first. Um, we're actually seeing something about angular momentum. This is pretty much the simplest system you can have with angular momentum in it, and we've already seen it. angular momentum quantized, at least the C component, in integer values. That's what Bohr proposed as one of his postulates about the hydrogen atom. So we're actually cracking into why the things he had to propose as postulates, because he didn't know, have a deeper underlying reason for being true. So that's kind of a big deal already. Um, what we have here is only one component of the angular momentum, but that's going to be our way to break into the full 3D problems. Frankly, the 3D problems we need to do separation of variables and spherical coordinates r theta phi, the Schrodinger equation, 
That's not as easy as the other separation of variables we've seen. So it'll take some work, and that's part of why I'm given this kind of introductory, simple problem. Uh, and I will note that when we want to, even in this simple system, calculate something for different states about the expectation of an operator, we integrate on all space, but all space is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And we have the standard formulation for how to do that. I'm not going to do that today. In fact, that's pretty much all I'm really doing about the ring. Um, but I wanted to say, as I told you at the beginning, a little bit about angular momentum more generally. Uh, I said I could have looked at the z component as the z component of r cross p. And I think you're convinced now that that would probably be harder than what I just did to get the wave functions. But it would be easier if I wanted to derive commutation relations. And we've already seen earlier in this course that commutation relations are generally pretty important. So I'm going to look at them in just a moment. Uh, at some point later, we're actually going to be defining operators via their commutation relations at times. So this is a big deal, and I want you to see how to do it. So I'm going to do one quick little example. Um, I can write out what all three components of angular momentum are in their classical versions, and then what the quantum operators break down as. So I know the commutators for x, px, and all the different variations. What I'm going to get to in the course, and I'm just going to do one part of an example today, is a general relation for the commutator of two different components of L, It'll give you a third component of L, and this thing that hopefully you've seen, it's called the levy sevita symbol. If not, I'll talk about it in class. It basically has value of 1, minus 1, or 0, and in particular, if any of these indices are the same, it's 0. Um, but we'll talk about that. I'm going to do one quick little example. Uh, we're going to use what we know, that is, for x and px, the commutator's ih bar, x commutes with y, px commutes with py, x commutes with py, and all the other versions with the different letters. I wrote a representative set of forms. Uh, the one example I'm going to work is the commutator of lx and ly. And frankly, there are a few ways to jump into this, and I'm going to go through kind of slowly, step by step. Uh, hopefully you won't get bored, but I write out what lx is, I write out what ly is. I can break this up into four commutators, first term, first term, just like you would do with binomials as a kid. And I've got these four commutators here. Maybe you're going to jump ahead of me. I hope you are. I just copied that over so that it fits on one line. And some of those uh, pieces commute with everything else. For example, here in this first term, there's only one thing with y. So that obviously commutes with everything else, so I can pull it outside. Uh, there's only one piece with an x, and I can pull that outside. Let me do that in all four terms. And maybe you would have jumped to the next step right away, because once I write that, you see, here i got a pz, pz. Those obviously commute with each other, as do z and z. So those middle terms are both zero. And that leaves me with two terms, one of which has pz, z, and the other of which has z, pz. Two minus signs, those will cancel. Uh, I know what the commutator of pz and z is. I know what the commutator of z and pz is. Right? They're just multiples of ih bar. If I put in the correct signs here, I end up with minus ih bar ypx minus xpy. Well, ypx minus xpy with a minus sign is L sub z. ih bar hangs along for the ride. So that was one example, and I could do all the rest, but I don't want to. I don't think you want to either. I just wanted to crack into that because we'll go through more of this. We'll use it in class, and we'll use it to build up our image of what's going on in the 3D Schrodinger equation. So with that, I guess I'll leave you alone. You can go back and study or whatever you were doing.